Okay, so today we're going to talk and go in more detail with the normal distribution and talk a little bit more about what that means for standardized testing. So, let's see. so first we need to talk about sampling. So what is sampling? And let's move this over so you can see. So sampling is looking at a smaller group rather than population. So when we're looking at standardized testing um, and we're looking at a national well, the norm reference sample, right, they didn't give that test to every single student in the United States. That would be impossible. So instead, they gave the test to a sample of students that represents the whole population. So what's important when we're looking at that sample? How do you know if that sample was a good sample? So it should be representative. Um, and in order for it to be representative, we typically want it to be randomized. That means that they didn't select specific students, but they selected a random amount of students. And typically, a larger sample is better than a smaller sample. And when we talk about norm reference samples, let's take a little look at what we mean by that for our schools. So a norm reference group is a sample of the population. And when you're considering this, you want to think, does your school population match the norm reference population? Or can you find your school in that norm reference population? So and so we're thinking about things like um, if your school is a suburban, urban, or rural school, is that in there? Um, are schools from your state uh, concluded in that norm reference population? Or you're part of the state? Um, your kind of geographic location, north, south, coastal, inland, um, those kinds of things might be important when you're thinking about the um, norm reference population. Also, the size of your school. Is it a small, medium, large school? Um, is it a parochial school or a private school or a public school? Is it a charter school or a magnet school? All of those things might be important, and you want to make sure that your type of school is included in that norm reference population. You also want to think about is your student included in that norm reference population. So you want to think about things like race and ethnicity, gender, um, students with disability status, and particularly this ex specific disability the student has. So things like ADHD and autism are pretty common and are probably included, but if your student has a fairly rare disability, you might want to be sure that that student's disability was included in that population. Same with students who speak languages other than English. If your student speaks Spanish, it's pretty likely that that language was included, but if it's a if it's a fairly uncommon language, they might not be included in that population, and that means that the types of inferences you can make about how your student fits in with that norming population might be um, more tenuous. You might not be able to make as strong of a conclusion if your students, if the type of student that you have wasn't included in that norming population. And another thing to think about is the use of local norms. So when we're talking about a national norm set, we're saying this is how my student compares nationally, which might not be as informative as if we use local norms. So knowing that my student is in the 10th percentile on a national level, it might be more informative to know that my student's in the 20th percentile in a school level because I'm making decisions at a school level. If my student's only is in the you know, 80th percentile nationally, but in the 95th percentile at my school, I probably still need to provide special services for them because the student is performing much higher than most of the school population and probably needs special services. Does that make sense? So we probably want to think about, in addition to national norms, thinking about how that student compares to the other students in the school population or in the district population. So let's talk about normal distribution. So remember, here's our normal distribution. Remember that beautiful curve? Remember that normal distribution? Um, when we're thinking about probability theory, and I'm going to go into a little bit of technical, uh, be a little bit technical here. This should refer back to your probability and statistics class. And the normal distribution, um, a very commonly occurring, it's called the continuous probability distribution. It's this function of the probability of any real observation will fall in between two limits or real numbers as the curve approaches zero on either side. Um, we're talking about this normal distribution again. Remember, it's it's where the mean, the median, the mode are equal, and 50% 50, 50 on either side. We have perfect symmetry in this normal distribution. And what data do we see that are normally distributed? Um, it's that basic random probability. 
um, heights of people tend to be normally distributed, the size of things produced by machines, errors in measurement we assume are normally distributed. Sometimes we are a little over, sometimes a little under. Um, blood pressure um, marks on a test when students haven't been studying or prepared for that test. Um, and we also assume that intelligence or IQ is normally distributed. Um, when we're looking at scores on tests, we do some statistical um, work, and um, I'm just going to call it, you know, behind the scenes um, work to make sure that these scores are normally distributed. So when we have standard scores on a test, we're going to assume that they're normally distributed. And we can make that assumption because the statisticians do that for us. So we're going to talk about converting raw scores now. And so we can see here's our nice normal distribution, right? Yay. And um, so raw scores are converted into derived scores or scaled scores. Remember last week we talked, or in our last lecture, we talked about raw scores. And we can't really interpret those raw scores. So instead, we convert them into derived or scale scores. And that's what we're talking about today. So we'll talk about derived scores today and scale scores um, in a future lecture. So this is scaling, and this is what the statisticians, the psychometricians do. So we don't have to do this process. Just know that we're not interpreting raw scores. We're going to interpret these scaled scores that will be given to you as a teacher in a test report from, a, from the testing company or from the school psychologist. And this enhances the comparability of test scores. So we can compare test scores across grades, across ages, and those kinds of things. Um, and then we can um, establish these cut scores or standards to compare students to each other. And standardized scores, when you hear that word standardized scores, that means it's based upon the normal curve. And that's a hint that it's from a um, norm reference test. So all of the scores we're talking about today are norm referenced because they're part of a normal distribution. So it's all related to how students did in comparison to each other. So a standard score Everything we're talking about today has to do with norm reference tests. And again, these are scores that would be given to us by a school psychologist based upon a raw score on a test that they'd already taken. So you should see um, there is a PDF in Canvas that looks similar to this. So hopefully you can pull it out and look at it as I'm going over this with you. So if you haven't done that, pause the video, download this. Um, and so you're going to need this sheet of paper when you take your celebrations of learning, when you're taking your quizzes, you're going to want to be able to look at this. And really, um, what I want to show you is how all of these types of scores really mean the same thing. So no matter how you get the score, if the school psychologist tells you a T-score or a standard score or a percentile rank, they're really just saying the same thing to you. And I really want you to be able to understand that. Because when you're in a meeting, when you're in an IEP meeting or a gifted meeting for a student, I want you as the teacher to really understand what's happening so that you can also talk to the parents as well. So the first thing you can see is a standard deviation. We talked about standard deviation in our last lecture, right? Remember the standard deviation is the average distance from the mean. So we can talk about how far from the average score is the student based upon the average distance. So, and it's really cool because standard deviations in a normal distribution fall in really predictable ways. So 68.2% of scores are with one, within one standard deviation of the mean. So most students, right, are within one standard deviation of the mean, right? They're pretty close to the mean. And we would say that those are not significantly different from the mean. If I'm within one standard devi deviation of the mean, I'm a I have a pretty average score, right? Nothing remarkable. Um, less than 0.3% of students are more than three center deviations of the mean. So that means that out of a thousand students, less than three of them are more than three center deviations away from the mean. Very few students in your teaching career would be this far away. So the next one we'll talk about are z-scores. And z-scores are the same as center deviation units, right? They range from negative four to four. So if I have a z-score of 0, that means I have an average score. If I have a z-score of 1, that means I'm 1 center deviation above the mean. We don't usually use z-scores in schools because uh, most parents don't want to hear that their kid has a negative number. It's just like not politically correct, right, to say, oh, yeah, your kid scored a negative 1 on this, right? So um, psychologists um, and people um, 
in maybe biology and some of the other sciences who don't deal with people um, use these scores in statistics, but um, in education we tend not to use these scores. Instead, we use what we call T-scores. And T-scores are the same as Z-scores, except they range from 0 to 100, and the mean is 50. So a 60 T-score would be the same as a 1 Z-score. Um, and so an 80 um, T-score T is a 3 Z-score. It's three standard deviations above the mean. Um, so it's a little bit confusing when you get to percentile ranks, because that also ranges from 0 to 100, but you can see the scale is really different. So a T-score is basically just the same as a standard deviation unit. It's just converted so it sounds prettier to parents. Let's talk about percentile ranks because it's um, probably the most um, reported to parents, and I think it's really the, mo the easiest to understand. So when you hear percentile ranks, you're really thinking about, an, again, a normal distribution. You're thinking about a norm reference score. And when I say, let's say, oh, this student scored in the 50th percentile, that means that that student scored um, higher than 50% of the students. That student is completely average, right, in the 50th percentile. Um, and we hear that pretty common. We hear the percentile ranks commonly. Um, if I'm in the 25th percentile, that means I scored higher than only 25% of the students. And you can see 25th percentile doesn't sound very high, but it's still within one center deviation of the mean. Can you see that on the chart? So 25th percentile, you're still within that average range. And you can see that's really different than other distributions. You can see that these percentile ranks get really scrunched up here in the middle. That's because most students score right within one center deviation of the mean. So those percentile ranks are really scrunched up here in the middle. Um, if I scored in the 95th percentile, that means that I scored um, higher than 95% of students, right? And again, 95th percentile, that sounds really high, but I'm within two center deviations of the mean. Just so you know, if to qualify for a gifted program in the state of Florida, I would have to score more than two center deviations above the mean. So if I'm going to talk about kind of what's average in students, I would qualify anything within one center deviation as above average, I mean as average. If I'm two Center deviations, between one and two center deviations, I might say that they're above average, but it's really not meaningful for any kind of diagnosis, although I might need to do more things in the classroom. If I'm more than two center deviations above the mean, that's where we're really going to start to talk about needing really special individualized services, either above or below the mean. Um, thinking about gifted programming on the upper end or self-contained and more definitely more support services for special education on the lower end of that. Okay, let's talk about uh, day nines next. So let's take a little history lesson here and we talk about computers and education. So back in the day, um, before we had microprocessing computers, um, we had what we called punch cards in computers. Did any of y'all go see um, hidden figures, right? And they had all these, all these cards that the computers were programmed by, right? So back in the day, we could only hold a very small amount of information about a student, right? In fact, what would fit on the punch card. And so we wanted to keep information about students and maybe their IQ scores, but we didn't want to hold a lot of digits. In fact, we only wanted to have one digit of number. So rather than filling out a whole, you know, three digits, for an IQ score, we divided kids into what we called stay nines. And stay nines represent half of a center deviation unit um, with a mid range of five, and they range from one to nine. So you can see here that a stay nine of, of five would be that midpoint, and it represents about 20% of the population. Then six and four is a half a center deviation away from that, and that's 17%, and then 7, 8, and then 9 and 1, you can see, is a much larger range of scores, but it's only 4% of the population. So again, we don't use stay nines a whole lot anymore in, um, in reporting scores because it's not very accurate. We never report like 4.5 in a stay nine. It's always just the whole number, but it is a way that, you know, you'll see old school psychometricians or psychologists or school psychologists report that stay nine, and it's just a way of grouping students um, by that normal distribution. Um, everything else, 
T scores, Z scores, percentile ranks, um, standard scores can all be broken down into decimals or fractions. Everything but the stainine. The stainine is always going to be um, reported as a whole number. Um, and now the standard score, and the standard score is sometimes um, referred to as the IQ derivative score. That standard score, and so when you hear someone say their IQ is blah, 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 they're literally talking about the standard score, and it's the other most common way to report um, a norm-referenced um, score based upon this normal distribution. Um, in a standard score, the mean is 100, it's always 100, and a standard deviation is 15 points. So if I have an IQ or a standard score of 115, that would mean that I'm one standard deviation above the mean. So a 130 would be two standard deviations above the mean. And again, a 130 is the cutoff for being identified for gifted programs in the state of Florida, although that varies by state what their laws and regulations are about identification for gifted programming. We'll talk more about that in, um, near the end of the semester when we talk about special populations. So you can see here um, what that what those scores mean and the percentage of populations. So you can see that an IQ of 160 would be such a small percentage of the population. So I'm always skeptical, you know, um, on Facebook when people take those IQ tests and they're like, ooh, I scored a 160. I'm like, oh, you didn't score a 160, honey, right? Um, that test is not very valid um, because the number of people who could possibly score a 160 is going to be such a small portion of the population that's very unlikely that I know someone with an IQ of 160, right? So you can kind of see what this would look like. Um, and again, um, we're going to start receiving special services in schools at 130 or 70, right? If I score and I, if I have an IQ of 101, that does not mean that I have an above average IQ, right? But that's still pretty close to average. Anything between 85 and 115, I'm still going to consider an average IQ or an average standard score, right? Because it's still within one standard deviation of the mean. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about normal distribution here. So what types of assessments do teachers interpret with normal distribution, right? And I think we've talked about this. Um, only norm reference tests, right? We're only looking at this normal distribution with norm reference tests. So if you hear something refer to a percentile rank or a Z score or a T score or a standard score, you know that's your clue. It's a norm reference test, right? And we don't use norm reference tests that often in school only for things that are diagnostic, things like IQ tests. Some achievement tests are norm reference, but really when we're thinking about IEPs or gifted identification, um, but most of what we do in school would not apply to this, right? Um, we're really thinking about when we're sitting in those IEP meetings with school psychologists here. Um, how would I use these types of data in the classroom? Again, it's not going to be very helpful for me to plan instruction. I'm not going to say, oh, my kid has an IQ of, you know, 75. I'm really going to plan some instruction to increase their IQ, right? Theoretically, we're not really increasing kids' IQ, right? That's something more genetic. Instead, we're going to be planning instruction. We're going to say, wow, it's going to take this kid longer to learn things, so I'm going to have to plan my instruction around that. I'm going to have to plan more supportive activities to help them reach that achievement that I know that they can do, but my instruction is going to have to be more supportive in order to help them with that. On the other hand, if I have a, if I have a kid with an IQ of 135, I'm like, wow, that kid's going to learn things faster. I'm going to have to give them more enrichment activities. I'm going to have to help them move through that curriculum more quickly so that they can stay challenged and engaged and learn new things every day, right? Um, and again, what does that standard score percentile rank tell us about a student? It tells us how they compare to other students um, at a national level or at a local level. So depending on our reference group, it's going to tell us how they compare to that norming population, that norm group. Okay, so in this, in these in-class activities, um, I want you to take some time. You can pause the video in a second, and I want you to take some time to do this activity and um, tell me.
um, if you have any questions. So what you should be able to do, so if, if this standard deviation is negative 2, standard deviation units tell me what the percentile rank would be, the Z score, the T score, the STA9, and the standard score. So fill out this chart and then tell me which row has the highest score, which row has the lowest score, and then tell me how you could use this information um, and if you have any questions. If you have difficulty filling out this chart, please email me and we can set up a meeting. I'd be happy to sit down with you and go over this with you, um, either in my office or also over the phone, okay? Um, otherwise, have a great day. I look forward to seeing your work this week. Bye!